the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9. We're going to pick up reading in verse 36. Last week we talked about uh, the anatomy of a deeper faith. And, and we talked about the physical and the spiritual purposes of the different uh, pieces of our anatomy. We talked about the brain. We talked about the heart, the hands, the feet. This morning we're going to be continuing this, this idea of practical Christianity. Now, I don't mean practical as in the rest of Christianity is not practical, but really looking at how our faith is, is, uh, is exercised in our daily lives, where the rubber meets the road, if you prefer that metaphor. So, if you're in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35, let me hear you say amen. Here's what God's Word says. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plent uh, plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Church, will you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you for the beautiful day that you have blessed us with. Thank you for the sunshine this morning. I am thankful for those who came out this morning to worship you in this house. Father, as we go through your word, I pray that our ears are open, our minds are open, and our hearts are open to what you would have to say to us. Father, I pray you use me to give the message uh, uh, that you have placed on my heart to your people. Father, help us. Help us take the words from the page or from the screen and show us how it is we can exercise them daily in our lives. Father, please help us have the desire and have the willingness to be doers of your word and not hearers alone. Help us practice our faith and exercise our faith when we depart this house this morning where the real mission field lies. Father, help us be encouraged, replenished, revived this morning. And Father, if there be anyone in the house this morning who does not know you, may this be the day that you call out to them and they realize that they are in need of a Savior, the only Savior possible, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this will be the day they rely and depend on Him. And it's in His name that I pray every single one of these things. Amen. Let me ask you guys a question. It's going to be rhetorical. Has anyone ever annoyed you? It might be the guy in the pulpit right now may have annoyed you once or twice. When I said that, Carla raised her hand. <laughs> of course you have. You've encountered someone in your life where it just seems that uh, you always know they are going to find some way to get under your skin. Right, Brother Sam? I mean, they just, they just do. Everybody has one of those people, or maybe multiple people, in their lives. I read of this Michigan community that uh, just became so agitated and frustrated with the young kid that delivered their papers in the morning. You see, he would come through at 4 or 5 in the morning, and his car had a, a leaky muffler. And when that thing came through the neighborhood, it was just loud. And it was obnoxious. And they would, it would wake the kids up. It would cause the dogs to bark. I mean, this community was going nuts because of this kid's muffler. So they got together in their, in their, their homeowners association. They said that we really only see two options. And those options are we can file a noise complaint or we can go to the newspaper company and ask for someone different to deliver our papers. Well, in the midst of that meeting, someone said, you know what, how about we do something a little different instead of trying to get this guy in trouble or instead of trying to complain, how about we do something about it? So what they did is they took up an offering of sorts. To show the love of Jesus, they put together this pool of money, raised $300, and repaired this kid's muffler. Well, once they did that and they, they, they had a conversation with the guy, they found out that he was underage, that his mom had recently passed away, and that he had dropped out of school and was working a few different jobs to try to support himself. So then they helped him get his GED, they helped him pay some bills, 
and all small acts of kindness that did not hurt them one bit, but consider their options to begin with. They could complain and try to find a way to get rid of their problem, or they could come alongside a fellow human being and try to help them out. Amen. Wouldn't the world look completely different if we did more of that? Amen. I've been trying to figure out how to apply this to the mineral post office, and I haven't got there yet short of delivering my own packages, but at least I'll go get them now. And at least you know what I'm struggling with this morning. Now, I'm not going to talk to you this morning about annoying people. And, but what I want to do is I want to look through God's Word with you and discuss the need to serve. Now, this is not going to be a pitch to, to get you guys to serve more here at Grace Church. Uh, this isn't a, a pitch to say, hey, we need help with VBS. <laughs> this isn't a pitch to say, hey, we want you to come out to Sunday school. This isn't a pitch to say, hey, there's some things that we can have you help out with at church. I'll stop with the bell. Remember that annoying thing I talked about? No, I'm not talking about that. Grace, we are blessed. We are blessed with people who, when there is a need... Odds are people are not hesitant to roll up their sleeves and to come and serve. Amen? But what I'm talking about instead is daily service to our Lord. The service that is not at the property at Grace. Not necessarily, necessarily affiliated with any particular ministry. But instead the type of service that we can perform each and every day as we go about our normal days of going to work, school, the grocery store, etc. We're going to put our focus this morning in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 36. And that, that verse starts out with this, and it's talking about Jesus, and this is what it says. It says, but when he saw, what did he see? The multitudes. When he saw the multitudes, we're going to stop right there for a moment. That word multitude is translated from the Greek word oklos, which means uh, it stresses the public nature of the crowd of people. So often it has this idea of being a, a great mass of people or this mob of people. But here's the thing, every day we are faced with, with different types of people, most of the time, unless you're a shut-in, amen? And that's a different conversation we'll talk after. We're, we come into contact with different people, our family, uh, friends, co-workers. And we can interact with them both face-to-face -face in these days, virtually. Jesus' ministry was never about serving or being isolated to a single group of people. Instead... The group that he ministered to were extremely diverse. They varied in uh, cultures. They varied in experiences. They varied in social status, professions, and conditions of living. He did not have one particular area or demographic of the people that he ministered to. And that's no different than every single person in here today. The first item we can look at through Jesus' ministry was the makeup of the multitude. What, what was the groups of people that he ministered to? What were they comprised of? Who were those people? What were they dealing with? Um, let's start with the first group. One group that we can see as we read about the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ that he ministered to were those who were suffering. Those who were suffering. If you have your Bibles, if you're a fast scroller or a fast flipper, I invite you to turn with me. We'll look at the Gospel of Matthew, same book, but we'll go to chapter 8. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8. Here's what God says in verse, God's Word says in verse 1. And when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, 
See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. You see, to understand the magnitude of this exchange, because it's so easy we can go through verses like this and say, okay, Jesus healed another person. He does it plenty of other times throughout the Bible. But to understand the magnitude of what ha- what's happening right here, in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry, a person who had leprosy was worse than a person who contracted COVID-19 in the year 2020. Amen? They, they, they were persona non grata. Any person who came into contact with a leper was considered ritually unclean, and you can see that in the book of Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. But they were considered spiritually or ritually unclean and was at risk for their life. You see, as I mentioned before, the leper was persona non grata. They were, they were outsiders. They were exiled completely from civilization. Lepers were to steer clear of those who were healthy. And not only were they to steer clear they had to alert someone who was healthy if they happened to come anywhere close to them. So not only did they have to deal with the fact that civilization, that, that, that society had exiled them, but they had to scream, stop, I'm a leper. It had to be embarrassing, right? Because not only were they dealing with this illness, not only were they dealing with the suffering of being a social outsider, but then they had to announce it to the world that they were. But Jesus did not shy away from this man. He saw this man not as a leper, but as someone who was suffering on many levels. Suffering physically from an ailment. Suffering emotionally by being outcast. He saw past the leprosy. He was not healthy, he was an outcast, and no doubt, he was a sad human being. Amen? Yet Jesus still saw the need, the need for him to be ministered to. Now, Jesus was able to heal him instantaneously. Now, understand, Christian, remember we're talking about practical Christianity, exercising your faith, daily service to your Lord. Now, I'm not saying that anybody has the power to, to, to put hands on somebody and heal them this morning, amen? So don't, don't, don't start getting weird on me. But what I am saying to you is that you may not have the power to heal someone who is ill, but you do have the power to call them and say, hey, Do you need me to run by CVS or Walgreens? Because I'd be happy to pick something up for you. Amen? You do have the power to offer to make a meal or, or, or to run an errand or to just say, hey, you know what? I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. Or, or heaven forbid, going to the, the store and picking up a get well card and filling it out and, and throwing it in the mail. It might get there once they're, once they're healthy, but hey, the thought counts, right? I'll stop picking on the post office. That's my last one. Little acts can make a huge difference to those who are suffering. Amen? Not these huge monumental things, but small little acts of kindness can make a person's day, week, year. It can change a person's life. I remember when I was in college, I went through a, I was, I was a peer advisor and I went through this suicide prevention seminar. And they talked about this guy who had was being bullied in school and, and and he was just having a rough time and and during school one day he had made it up in his mind he, he didn't tell anybody he didn't write a note he didn't leave a message he just he had made up in his mind that he, he had made up in his mind that you know what today's the day I'm going to take my life I'm done with it I just can't take it anymore And he happened to drop a book. Now, the book wasn't slapped out of his hand or anything like that. He just happened to drop a book in the hallway. And someone came up and picked up that book and handed it to him and said, Is this yours? 
And he said that small act of kindness gave him hope. In that moment, he saw that everything wasn't all bad. And so simple, right? Picking up something that someone had dropped, he said and he credited with saving his life. Simple acts of kindness make an impact, church. And that can be an effective ministry for every single person in the house or watching along this morning. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 says, My little children, let us not love in word. Don't just say it. Neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Our actions should speak love just as quickly, if not quicker, than our mouths are to say, we love someone. We have love for our mellow, uh, fellow men. We have, we have love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's move on. Another group that Jesus ministered to, and by the way, you can too, are those who were disliked or even hated. Those who the world wants nothing to do with. Those who are alienated, those who people just can't, can't seem to get along with, and maybe you're one of those people who, don't, who can't get along with them. But you have a powerful, powerful way to minister by reaching those people who the world seems to forget or the world seems to hate. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, we're introduced to a, let's just say a fellow of rather... Small stature. Amen? Anybody know who I'm talking about? Zacchaeus, absolutely. He was the chief tax collector. So you know he was everyone's favorite person in the room. Amen? How many people just love the Internal Revenue Service? I'm going to let you in on a secret. My brother Junior back here in the 90s worked for the Internal Revenue Service. I never once hear him advertised that he worked for the IRS or when he worked for the IRS, ever hear him mention it. I'm going to tell you how much people didn't like, or the fact that people don't like the IRS, but he brought it upon himself. I remember him telling my parents, I'm waiting for you guys to slip up on your taxes because I get a reward for turning people in. <laughs> yeah. People wonder why people don't like to work for, or like those who work for the IRS. But understand, this, this short little guy... Zacchaeus, was, he was the chief tax collector. So people naturally didn't like him, right? They, they, they grumbled about him. They murmured about him. But the Bible tells us that he wanted to see Jesus. And because of his stature, he was so short, when Jesus was coming through, he could not see over the crowd. Now, this man wanted to see Jesus so much that he didn't let that stop him, but instead he climbed up into a tree. Now, I'm going to tell you, the Methodist church in Louisa has ruined this part of the Bible for me. And I'll tell you why. Because there was a time when they had on their front sign, Danny DeVito in a tree. And I could not figure out what they were talking about. Well, finally, I asked somebody who went there and they told me it was, it was, it was this this part of the Gospel of Luke. But every time I read this now, I think of Danny, De Danny DeVito being crouched up in a tree looking out for Jesus. Amen? Sorry, that's a sidebar. The Bible tells us that he wanted to see Jesus so much, he climbed up in a tree, and no offense to the Methodist church in case they might watch this. Amen? <clears throat> but, he couldn't see over the crowd, he climbed up in this tree, and in the Luke Gospel, or the Gospel of Luke chapter 19 Verses 5 through 7, it says this. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and he said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and he received him joyfully. You know, most people who were hated, most people who were murmured about, most people who were gossiped about, most people who were disliked, you rarely associate with those people, those people with someone who is joyful. But here, just because Jesus extended an invitation, or rather asked to stay in his home, he came down that tree quickly, and he did so joyfully. And verse 7 says, And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with that man that is a sinner. 
See, when it comes to serving the Lord and your, your daily walks with Jesus, it doesn't matter what the other people murmur or say. It doesn't matter what other people think. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what matters is, is that you are doing something to try to show the love of Jesus Christ. What everybody thinks, let them murmur, right? But even the people that society says aren't worth it. You might as well give up. They're, they're long gone. They're too far. They couldn't be any further from the Lord. No. We should still be reaching out. We should still be trying to minister to those. What do you see happen when Jesus acknowledged this man, this, this man that was up in the tree? It said Zacchaeus received him joyfully and sometimes... Friends, sometimes, brothers and sisters in Christ, all it takes is a simple connection to a person which causes their complete mindset to change. We were at Brother Gage's graduation yesterday, and, and he got up and shared a few words, and that's one of the things he said. He said, you know what, I was having a bad week, and all it took was someone spending some time with him, taking him out to breakfast, and just offering him some encouragement and some hope. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we, you, can be that hope for someone. A kind word, an invitation to a meal, an invite to your house, a simple asking how people are doing, and you know what? Do something shocking and actually listen to how they're doing. And if they say, I'm fine, say, no, 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 tell me, really, how are you? A simple connection to a person can change their whole mindset. People who are disliked, people the world, who the world say are, are, are not worth your time, they still need Jesus too. Amen? You can be that person which shows them Christ. Because hatred for someone hurts you as much as anybody else. Amen? I'll tell you something that's funny about hatred. You ever known somebody that every time they see you, they smack you on your back? Do you know people like that? I don't know, to me, because I'm, I'm larger than the average human being. I feel like there's some people who make it a point like it's like they want me to know that, they, that I feel them. Well, understand, I got more to feel, right? You can hit me easier, I'll still feel you. It's just more intensified. Some people just like smacking you on your back. I read this thing about this guy who said, you know what? I can't stand this one. I hate the fact that this person smacks me on my back. So you know what I'm going to do? And it's, it's completely absurd what he said. He said, I'm going to take a stick of dynamite, TNT, I'm going to stick it in my coat. I can't wait for him to smack my back now. He hated someone so much that all he could think about was when he smacked that TNT, it was going to blow up in that guy's face, probably take a limb, might even take his life. Hmm. He was completely oblivious to the fact that it was going to kill him too. Big dummy. <laughs> Hating people is like burning down your own house to get rid of a rat or a spider. I tell people all the time, my wife Crystal turns into a mob boss when she's just a spider in the house. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his friends dead. All of them gone. She turns into a lunatic. Whatever issues you may have with an individual is not so severe that it should cost them eternity in hell. Amen? No matter the situation you find yourself in, there is never a reason to compromise your testimony for Jesus Christ. No matter what people do or say. A simple reaching out and extension of the proverbial olive branch can be a huge step in showing the love of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 tells us this. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Understand everything we do is offensive to God. The Bible tells us our, our righteousness is, is, is but filthy rags. Like There is nothing that we can do within ourselves that are, is pleasing to God. Why? Because we were born in to sin. But you know what? Jesus Christ still went to the cross to save us wicked people 
And if he can forgive us, if he can sacrifice himself, I'm jumping ahead in my message, if he can sacrifice himself, we can forgive somebody for what they've done to us, what they've said to us, the way they act towards us, our perception of a situation. We can forgive them even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. Hate or any association with it should have no place in the Christian's heart. None. There should not be room for it. Let's move on. Another group we'll talk about this morning are the sinful people. That's right. Jesus ministered to the sinners. You know, those downright, dirty, depraved sinners He reached out to. You know, Christian, this morning you can be sure of this. There are two types of sinners. Amen? There are the sinners that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And there are those sinners who are still drowning in the filth of iniquity. That's it. And by the way, you fall into one of those two categories this morning. Amen? You have either been washed by the blood and made righteous because of the atonement of sin by Jesus Christ, or you are still relying upon yourself to be righteous enough to make it to heaven. There's only two types of sinners. But just because a person is a sinner, or was a sinner in this scenario, did not stop Jesus from associating with them or ministering to them. And by the way, you can do the same. Here's where I get that from. Very familiar set of scriptures in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. I'll read verses 15 through 17. Here's what God's Word says. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house while he was having a meal at the house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. Most people know this, but publicans were the tax collectors. Once again, he was dining with the IRS. For there were many, and they, were, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are, uh, they that are whole have no need of the physician. Those who, are, those who are healthy have no need for a doctor. But they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus gave his whole reason for his earthly ministry in one sentence. He came to call sinners to repentance. Now, when we see these scriptures, or this scripture, that says that Jesus ate with the tax collectors and the sinners, you may have this image in your mind. You may have this image of what type of sinners was it that Jesus was sitting with. But odds are, the images in your mind could say, okay, well, he must have been eating with the, uh, he must have been eating with the adulterers. He, he must have been eating with the, uh, with the thieves. He, he must have been eating with the prostitutes. He, he must have been eating with with all these different, whatever sin you want to put in, those people. But understand, remember who were calling these people sinners. It was the Pharisees. And in order for you to be classified as a sinner by the Pharisees, you know all you had to do was disagree with them. Do something different than what they thought was right. See, the Pharisees would consider a person a sinner if they didn't agree with them or or see eye to eye on them, with Scripture, the law, the Word of God. You were deemed a sinner if you didn't have the same hygiene as the Pharisees. You You were deemed a sinner by the Pharisees if you didn't follow the same dietary laws as them. Now, regardless of what the sin was, here's here's the thing I want to drive out. Romans 3.23, most of, you, most of you know it. It says, for all have sinned that come short of the glory of God. 
Christian, the greater challenge for us is to reach out to those who we don't necessarily always agree with. Like these Pharisees who would find any reason, any person who went against what they said were deemed a sinner. I understand that you're not going to agree with everyone you come across. And there are going to be people you disagree with 99% of what they stand for and what they say. And I'm even talking about Christians. The greater challenge for us is to reach out to those people. To those we don't always agree with. Those who are not in our immediate social circles. And even those who may be living in sin. If they're a follower of Christ, then you have the most important thing in common. And that is the same Lord and Savior. The only true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If they're not a believer, then you have an opportunity to share your faith. To proclaim the truth of the gospel. And even though a supposed Christian may not even acknowledge a person exists, or criticizes them for their lifestyle, you may be that friendship. You may be that connection that points them to God. Amen? You might be the only Bible that that person reads. You might be the only church, the only house of God that that person will know up until that point. The Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 17 tells us this. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If Jesus did not take the approach of condemnation, then what gives you or I the right to condemn another human being? Because there are none of us that are as righteous. There are none of us that are perfect like Jesus, and he didn't come to condemn. And neither should we as followers of him. Back to our original text. From Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. First it said, but when he saw the multitudes, and we just talked about all the types of people that Jesus had ministered to. God's word continues by saying, he was moved with compassion on them. Jesus had mercy. For the multitude. See, we saw the makeup of the multitude, but now we need to understand he had mercy upon or for the multitude. He was compassionate. Christian, it is your job. It is your duty. It is my duty to be empathetic and show compassion as well. Amen? What kind of mercy did Jesus have? What type of compassion did Jesus have? Well, he had mercy from God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, most quoted scripture in history. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God was so empathetic toward his creation. He sacrificed His Son. No, no, no. Better yet, He sacrificed Himself. Because He loved us. And sadly, for most Christians, here's the most empathy you'll ever get from us. I'm sorry. And that's it. That's where it ends. No more compassion. No more understanding. I'm sorry. Let's keep it moving. Not only did Jesus have mercy from God, but He also had sacrificial mercy. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, God's Word says this, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay down it myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. Jesus made it a point to say his life was not sacrificed because he was being overpowered by any sort of worldly forces. But instead, 
because He was merciful to those who needed their relationship with God reconciled. And guess what? They are every single person that has ever existed, that exists now, and if the Lord tarries His coming, will exist in the future. Everyone in this house, everybody watching alone, along, everyone needs their relationship with God reconciled. Why? Because we're not worthy of that relationship. The Bible tells us there are none who seek God. No, we need Jesus to be that reconciliation. Now, am I saying that you as a Christian, because remember we're talking about how do we exercise our faith daily? How do we have that, how, how do we do that daily service to God? Am I saying that you have to lay down your life? No. That's not what I'm saying because likely there are going to be none of us. Not a single one of us that will be put in that position where we're going to have to die for our faith. But we are called to sacrifice for God's sake. Amen? If you are following Jesus, you will be called to sacrifice. Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your abilities. I'm sure that every single Sunday school teacher, children's church leader, musician and singer can tell you that there is a time commitment associated with them serving the Lord. You know what that is? Sacrificing of time. For preparation, for prayer, and for the act itself. But for our daily service, our daily service, the sacrifice is no different. We may need to take a couple of extra minutes of our day to help someone who's in need. We may need to have that uncomfortable conversation when the Lord impresses upon our heart that we should share the gospel with someone we've never met before. Someone we bump into. I was going to say at the post office, but I said I wouldn't talk about the post office anymore. Someone we bump into at a gas station. Someone we bump into at work. Who, whatever it may be. The Christian is called to sacrifice. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 45, God's Word said, For even the Son, uh, uh, Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life ransom for many. Jesus showed mercy. He showed compassion. And we should as well. Not only did He show godly mercy, and not only did He show, show sacrificial mercy, but He also was eager to show mercy. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, God's Word says this, The Lord slack, is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slack, slackness, but is longsuffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He is not willing that any should perish. And guess what? That should challenge your mindset. And my mindset. Because we should have an eagerness to serve our Lord daily. We should be actively looking for ways to serve Christ. Do you long for, do you, do you desire to serve God little by little each day? Are you looking for ways? Are you proactively looking for ways to serve Him daily? Jesus was dead set on showing people mercy. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 39, God's Word says this, And He went a little further and fell on His face and, and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from Me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as Thou It is human nature to be selfish. Amen? When you have a lot to do or when you're weary and you're tired or when you're feeling a little discouraged yourself, understand, Christian, it is still important. It is still important to seek God's will for your life, even when it's hard. His will for your life is to serve Him daily. What did Jesus say even in that brief moment when he asked God, when he asked the Father in heaven to relieve him of his calling of going to the cross, even in his human nature for that brief moment, what did he still say? Not my will, 
but yours. We should be faithful in seeking God's will every day, but then being faithful about staying within His will. How often does God put someone on our hearts to call or, or go visit, and we put it off to another day? How often does God put that ministry on your heart to give to? Or, and we say, you know what? I just don't have the money right now. Things are a little tight, Lord. How often does God tell us that we should share the gospel and we neglect to do it? God's will should always come before personal preference and priority. Amen? It should be the primary priority in the Christian's life. We'll wrap up verse 36. Back in our original text, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it said, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Every one of us should have compassion. And that verse concludes with this phrase. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus saw the multitudes and we talked about the makeup of the multitudes. We talked about the fact that Jesus showed mercy upon the multitudes. And we'll finish with Jesus having mindfulness for the multitude. He was aware and in tune with them and their needs. He was concerned for them. Are you mindful of those who are living without Jesus Christ? Do they even cross your mind? Does it concern you at all? Uh, let me rephrase. Uh, does it concern you enough to actually do something about it? Verse 36 says that they fainted. That word is translated from the Greek word, ekleo. And what it means is to give out or to become weary. That means the people who are vulnerable. That means the people who are seemingly powerless. You see, those people Jesus was mindful of. David shared the sentiment of, of these type of people in Psalm 124, or 142, excuse me, verse 4. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Understand, especially in this world right now, there's so many people who are searching for positive reinforcement by the number of clicks they get on their social media posts. There are so many people who are looking for some type of response by just saying the most reckless and outrageous things they can imagine in public and online. There are people who are desiring to have some type of real human connection. <laughs> They're willing to do almost anything, even if it causes some type of acrimonious dispute. Why? Just because they have some type of human connection. Christian, there are so many people who long for someone to show them love, actually the love of God. To share with them why someone has faith. But unfortunately, so many Christians, so many followers of Jesus ignore the spiritually feeble. Disregard them. Go past them. Many in this world feel like the Ethiopian who asked Philip in Acts chapter 8, How can I, except some man, should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would, know, uh, he would come up and sit with him. All he wanted was that connection. All he wanted was to try to glean some of that understanding that Philip had. Brothers and sisters in Christ, a lot of times, a simple conversation has everlasting consequences. Let me say that one more time. If, you, if, if you've zoned out on me in the last couple of minutes, pay attention to this part. Sometimes all it takes is a simple conversation with an unbeliever that is the difference between heaven and hell. Because that connection and that conversation will open them up to the call of God. Now it still takes God and it still takes the Holy Spirit. But understand, you have the ability 
to plow the ground in order for that seed to be planted. And it can make the difference between heaven and hell. Matthew chapter 9 tells us that the people are scattered as sheep having no shepherd. Folks, the church is here. Grace is here to minister to the lost and to the saved. But the church is not a building. And I know I'm saying that to, to probably a group that's made up majority of Christians, if not all Christians. I know you understand that this is not the church. Instead, the people are the church. Sadly, many of the people you encounter will never darken a door of a house of worship. They'll never come to a church building. But you, as the church, you as the body of Christ, have the ability to reach those who are hurting, to reach those who need God. And by the way, you don't have to go far. We are surrounded every day by them. You have to be mindful of them just as Jesus is. In the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 14, it says this, How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in Him uh, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, a lot of people read that text and they say, You know what? That just absolved me of the whole situation. Because it says, How will they hear without a preacher? Well, know that word preacher is not just reserved for pastors and preachers who get in the pulpit. In fact, that word preacher comes from the Greek word kariso. And what that means is simply to announce and publicly proclaim a specific message. That's what that means. So that means, in essence, that every single follower of Jesus Christ is a preacher. Because we should be publicly proclaiming the truth of the gospel. We should be publicly professing the fact that we knew we were a sinner in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. We should be publicly telling the world that He is the only way to heaven. That there is no other who will come to the Father but by Him. Every single one of us are preachers. I'll close with this. You may be saying that you don't know why you had to hear this message this morning. Well, I'm going to tell you why. You could be extremely faithful in your church. You could be faithful to Bible study. You could be faithful to prayer life. You could serve in some capacity, but odds are, odds are you're presented with opportunities to serve God daily, and you miss those opportunities by either failing to recognize them or recognizing them and doing nothing about it. There are a multitude of reasons for that, by the way. And in God's Word, we see plenty of people used by God who had reasons they couldn't serve because they seemed, let's just say, unqualified. And you know them too, by the way, if you know the Bible. Moses stuttered. David's armor didn't fit. Timothy had health problems. So Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Amos' only training was the fact that he knew how to take care of fig trees. Jacob was a liar. David had an affair. Solomon was too rich. Jesus, well, I guess he was just too poor. Abraham was too old. David was too young. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus was dead. John was considered self-righteous. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer. And guess what? So was Moses. Jonah ran away from God. Miriam was a gossip. Gideon and Thomas doubted. Jeremiah was depressed. Elijah was burned out. John the Baptist was a loudmouth. 
Martha was a worrier. Mary was perceived as lazy. Samson had long hair. Noah got drunk. All these things people could easily say disqualified them from being, from being effective for God. In the book, The Fourth Dimension, the, the author writes this. God doesn't require a job interview. He doesn't hire and fire like most bosses because He's more than a boss. He is our Father. He doesn't look at financial gains or losses. He's not prejudiced or partial. Not judging, grudging, sassy or brassy. <laughs> not deaf to our cry, nor blind to our needs. As much as we try, God gifts us. Or rather, God's gifts are completely free. Of no charge to us. We could do wonderful things for many people and still not be wonderful in ourselves. Do you understand that? You can be a mess up and God can still use you. Now you should be pursuing a life that isn't so complicated and sin-filled. Right? You should be pursuing a life of holiness, but you can still be a mess up and God can still use you in mighty ways. Satan says, you are not worthy. You don't know enough. <laughs> you don't even live a life that glorifies God now. You're not worthy to serve the Lord. You're not worthy to glorify God. Satan says all those things. <laughs> the world says all those things. Jesus says, so what? I am. And if you have Jesus Christ then you are too. Satan looks back and sees our mistakes, but, but God looks back and He sees the cross. Amen? Christian, this morning, know that God can and will use you, but you have to be willing. You have to be open to it. In little ways daily, you can have a tremendous impact to the kingdom of God if you're following His lead. Today I hope that you pray for God to open doors in your life for you to serve. And I pray that you walk through those doors when you recognize them. And I'll close with this. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. Here's what God's word tells us. For ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love to serve one another. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, I am thankful this morning for your word. I am thankful for the message. Father, I just want to say right now, I want to ask for your forgiveness publicly. For all those times that you've oppressed upon my heart to reach out to someone or to do something and I push it off to another day. And let's be honest, it never gets done. Father, I ask your forgiveness for those times when I saw opportunities to serve you and I thought, I'm so busy doing the other things for God, I don't have time for this one. Father, I ask your forgiveness for those times in which I knew that you were leading me to share my faith with someone. And I said, you know what? That's probably just my pride thinking that I need to go <laughs> and try to talk to someone. Father, forgive me for all those times that I fell short in my daily service to you. Father, I pray this morning that every single one of us will be honest with ourselves and honest with you to say, I need that forgiveness and Father, I pray that we commit to recognizing and looking for ways to serve you daily in our lives. And as we leave this house, I pray that we don't forget the words that were shared, your words that were shared. But Father, rather, I pray that we realize, as the banner says at the back of this house, 
You're now entering your mission field. Father, I pray we view the world as that. A place to serve you. Father, I thank you, I praise you, and I love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen.